and welcome to the Life After Lockdown event, Art After Lockdown. Um, as everyone's joining, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our event today and then I'll introduce our panellists. Um, so this series is presented by um, UTS and it aims to think through the challenges of post-lockdown life with the help of experts from the sector. Um, the arts has been one of the most deeply impacted industries in Australia with the closure of galleries, museums, festivals and performance venues of all kinds in March. Uh, but with some spaces beginning to reopen, it's clear that the current crisis has not been felt evenly across the sector um, and it's been revealing the existing precarities and fault lines of the industry. I'm Eleanor Zeichner, I'm the Assistant Curator at UTS Gallery and Art Collection, and it's my pleasure to introduce our panel for today, which you can see on the screen. Um, so we have Dr. Shireen Farge, who is a contemporary artist and the Director of the Photography course in the School of Design at UTS. We have Lee Small, CEO of Sydney Film Festival. We have Emily McDaniel, who's an independent curator and Dr. Deborah Adelaide, who's a lecturer in creative writing at UTS. Um, before we begin with our questions and passing over to the panel, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus stands. And I'd like to pay respect to elders past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this place. And as we tune in from across Sydney and further afield, I extend that respect to the places that this event reaches. Um, so as you can see, everyone's on our screen. Um, bear with us if we have any technical problems and send through your questions. We'll um, have some time at the end for Q&A um, after we've gotten through our questions here and we'll have some time to put them to the panel. Uh, so let's begin. Um, my first question is for Shireen. Uh, Shireen, you recently wrote about um, the closure of Carriage Works and um, your personal relationship to Carriage Works. Uh, of course, we know Carriage Works went into voluntary administration in early May and its future is still uncertain. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how, how that's been for you as an independent artist and also what its closure means for the state of the arts generally in New South Wales. Thanks, Eleanor. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll give you a bit of background to my relationship with Carriage Works, um, which prompted my article in the conversation. So I'm an artist in residence there. Um, I've been there for over one year. Sorry, that's our dog walk having a one second. <laughs> Should I do some padding in the meantime? <laughs> Let's let her talk. It's like the dog walker arrived at the exact moment. Perfect, perfect timing. So um, I've been there um, with a whole group of artists um, working in the studio. It's called the clothing store. And um, I've also been an exhibiting artist there last year as part of the, um, the event called The National. And um, I'm commissioned by Carriage Works and Performance Space um, to, I would have worked, uh, done a project uh, this year at the end of the year, um, which has been postponed. So when, um, when we heard that Carriage Works had gone into voluntary administration, I think um, we were all very, very shocked, very um, kind of upset, disappointed, disbelief, I think are the words. And I think largely because it is a major institution in New South Wales, it's a rare institution. It's um, not, like if I think of the three major institutions in Sydney, um, we've got the Art Gallery of New South Wales, the MCA and Carriage Works. They all serve very, very different purposes. Um, and Carriage Works is one of those venues. It's a multi-arts form venue. It doesn't hinge on a private, uh, on an institutional collection or any collection for that matter. Um, and it supports uh, artists in really diverse ways and supports, um, I think, the creative industries in general. So you can see that they have um, events like Sydney Festival, Vivid, Fashion Week, etc. Uh, there. So I think for the arts uh, community, it was yet another 
indicator, COVID or not COVID, of the lack of support for the arts in New South Wales. Um, when we saw our Victorian counterparts receiving uh, funding in addition to funding that was previously allocated to Arts Victoria, um, you know, we were hoping, I guess, for a similar um, support to be announced by the New South Wales government, which wasn't. Um, what was announced instead was that the Arts Minister, Don Harwin, had stepped down. No Arts Minister had taken his place and still hasn't, um, with Gladys Berejiklian, and the Premier, um, being an in, the interim Arts Minister. And I don't imagine that she would have a lot of time to spend thinking about the state of the arts in New South Wales during COVID, given her huge responsibility. So, um, yeah, Carriage Works has kind of been left in a particular situation, which I think is not just due to COVID, um, and there were previous issues there, but I think when you look at what Carriage Works is asking for by way of, you know, assistance and financial assistance, it's just such a small amount of money. And, um, and I think, you know, it, what to, to allow Carriage Works to kind of have to force itself into voluntary um, administration um, and then to kind of bandy about ideas around the Opera House and whatnot, it kind of, I think, signals something that all uh, arts workers, artists, curators, directors of institutions already know about arts in New South Wales and in Sydney. And that is usually it is geared towards tourism, being some sort of spectacle. There is very little um, interest in developing a rich, critical, rigorous, diverse and uh, culture, which is what we desire, not Vivid Lights Festival. Um, and I think that that conversation, like if anything, the carriage work situation needs to um, kind of instigate a really, um, you know, open discussion about what the arts are in New South Wales, which is far more than ballet and the opera house. That's a great, um, well-rounded response, Shireen. Thank you for your thoughts there. And I think we haven't been given a lot of reason to expect the situation will improve with regard to state support. Um, though there are calls from across all of the industries for more federal support, for more local support. I think you're echoing a lot of people's concerns at the moment. Um, I wanted to lead that into a question for Emily, which is about um, the life of an independent practitioner at this time. Um, Emily, you um, have an independent curatorial practice which focuses on storytelling through the work of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists, including a major recent project announced by the City of Sydney, Harbour Walk, which looks amazing. Um, could you tell us a bit about what impact lockdown has had on that, that project um, and just how you've been navigating this time with, um, as an independent practitioner. It's been an incredibly difficult time. As an independent curator, I have lost the majority of my projects with museums and galleries in particular. And unfortunately that work cannot be compensated through job keeper or job saver. And with limited uh, permanent employment opportunities within the arts sector already, um, I think my experience has been quite a common experience for many people working within the arts. You know, the visual arts sector relies on independent arts workers to provide fresh ideas and perspectives and exhibitions to museums and galleries. And to bolster their workforce, which is also quite limited. It was our exhibitions that were the first to be cancelled. And I think it's important to recognise that when opportunities are given to curators and creative producers, inevitably, these opportunities also benefit and support the work of artists and creative practitioners and that ecology. Um, fortunately, I've been able to continue my work with the Harbour Walk, albeit with a few less resources. 
And I think this is largely due to the fact that this work exists outside of museums and galleries and in the public space. And with the current emphasis on federal and state governments on building an infrastructure to support the economy, I think we're surprisingly in a good position to continue doing the important work that we're doing, which is sharing First Nations stories spoken by First Nations people in the public space. Um, I found that our ability to continue with consultation and engagement with the community, which is, you know, the foundation of everything we do, was severely limited as so many of our elders were at risk during this period of COVID with their underlying health issues. And I think it's important to acknowledge that the inextricable connection between Aboriginal health and arts and culture. However, interestingly, I saw a change in the way all Australians thought about public space and storytelling. I, I observed this sense of longing from people for public spaces, for the environment, for nature, for the kind of sensorial experience of what it means to be on country, you know, to dip your feet into the water, to be barefoot on grass, to hear waves crashing on the harbour foreshore, you know, and that sense of longing is something we as First Nations people feel every single day, uh, whether it's for the country we're on or from the country we're from. So it was quite beautiful to see that emotion reflected in people, you know, that we were limited from accessing our public spaces, but we longed for them nonetheless. And I think that has really um, shown me the importance of a project like the Harbour Walk, a curated series of stories, public art interpretation along a nine kilometre stretch of Sydney Harbour. Um, also coinciding with Black Lives Matter, it's about all Australians seeing what we see, what we hear, what we feel when we're on country and having a greater understanding for what we do. So I think with the closure of museums and galleries as a physical space dedicated to arts experiences, I think it's highlighted the necessity and importance for art in public spaces. Thank you so much, Emily. I love the idea that there's this um, communal sense of longing for, for being in public space that um, you can frame for us as being through a First Nations lens. Um, and I really look forward to seeing that work come about and those, those stories being told. Um, and the idea of the arts being an ecology that's really interdependent, you know, that, um, that everyone's relying on each other for um, their practice to exist and to be heard. I think that's um, become so obvious through this crisis. Um, and I think for uh, Deborah, I wanted to ask you um, for a perspective from the literary world, because um, you have have many hats. So you're an author, you're an editor of Southerly, and you lecture in creative writing um, at UTS. Um, I wanted to get your perspective on how lockdown has impacted the Australian literary community, um, especially in the wake of the recent loss of multi-year funding for so many of the um, literary journals through the Australian Council. Um, we often think of writers as being quite solitary, but of course they also need, um, you know, spaces to talk and to think as well. Would you give us a bit of insight about that? Um, yeah, thanks, Eleanor. Just before I respond, can I can I just say, um, Emily, thank you for making those comments about particularly about longing, which I I find really moving, and already I'm thinking about the implications of that um, for me and my own personal practice. So, thank you very much. Um, really, really thoughtful and thought provoking um, response there. Um, so with Writers, of course, um, we have some practical challenges as well as some artistic and creative challenges. And I think we might come to the artistic creative challenges a little bit later. Um, the practical challenges are really interesting because, of course, writers 
are used to working on their own. They're used to working in isolation. Um, they're used to working in their pajamas, some of them. So a lot of lockdown feels very normal for writers. Writers, of course, are also like so many creative practitioners used to very, very low incomes. And also writers are often asked to do things for nothing. Writers are often enlisted to support charity causes, for instance, and generally, and, and I think creative practitioners are, are included in this too. And generally, you know, writers want to respond, they want to help, but they, they really know they shouldn't be giving away their art for nothing. Um, and this sort of brings us to one of the big challenges at the moment. You, you, you mentioned my involvement with Southerly. Um, and Southerly has recently suffered from a huge loss of financial support from the Australia Council. Now, Southerly's not alone. Um, like many of the major literary journals in this country, it has relied for a long time on support from the Australia Council. And Southerly is Australia's oldest, longest, uh, continuously published literary magazine. Last year, we celebrated our 80th year. And it's also played a very important role, um, not just as an academic journal, but as a place for supporting new and emerging writers. And that really cannot be, the importance of that can't be overstated in a country like Australia, where writers really, really need all the support they can get. Not that Australia is not a, a really supportive reading culture. In fact, it is. Australia has really, really high um, involvement of, of very active, and supportive readers, but it's still a, a relatively small population. So the, I guess the problem for writers at the moment is, is coping with the double whammy of having those sorts of um, outlets compromised. Um, and then with lockdown, having all the ancillary things that writers do. So writers very, very rarely make money from what they do in terms of their writing. But what they do do is make run make money from um, attending literary festivals, running workshops, um, giving talks, all sorts of things that, of course, have now been cancelled, put on hold, or shifted online. <clears throat> My own situation is probably a little bit less typical because. Well, I actually do regard myself as a full-time writer, but that's that's the evening and the weekend job. The other full-time job, of course, is my role at UTS as an associate professor in creative writing. Um, but I still remember what it's like being a full-time creative practitioner and the pre precariousness of that existence with no holiday pay, no sick pay, no superannuation, and just having to scrounge for work when and where you can. Um, if I'd had all my my literary events just taken away from me, it, it, it could have impacted really badly on me. Now, some writers of, you know, creative people respond in creative ways and some writers have been amazing in throwing themselves into this strange new world. Um, I know some writers who, for example, have, having had all their gigs cancelled, having the, the launch of their new book cancelled, have just shifted to a weekly online book club chat situation. That, of course, means being your own PR person, your own agent, your own manager, everything. But that is not actually providing much of an income, I suspect, but is that, it, it is bringing in a lot of interest from people. So I've noticed that the, um, the online events that I've been joining either as a participant or as an observer have been very, very well attended. And I think people, and this goes back to what um, Shireen and Emily have already said, people are hungry. They are really hungry for content. They're really hungry to be, to be kept in touch and they're hungry to be nourished by the sorts of things that creative practitioners can provide them. Thank you, Deborah. I think that's um, such an important point is that, you know, we, we use the arts to nourish and to tell stories and 
um, just because we can't be in the same places doesn't mean we, we, we lose that, that desire. And I think um, someone like the Sydney Film Festival has really stepped up to, um, to fill that and to figure out a way to deliver a festival um, in a totally new way. Um, Lee, my next question's for you. And, um, you know, it's been incredible to see that the Sydney Film Festival has so rapidly moved to a digital model follow, following lockdown. And just from now, you can start viewing online, on the online program. On today. On today. Um, could you tell us a bit ha about how um, you managed to retool the delivery model so quickly um, and whether you think that's going to be a long term strategy for audiences to experience the festival, the films, the filmmakers? And the second part of my question is, um, how do you anticipate um, a move to digital um, impacting the ongoing accessibility of the festival. So I'm thinking about people with a disability, people with uh, in regional remote areas who might not be able to attend in person. Okay, um, thank you for that question and I'll keep them separate because they're, they're a lot, lot to answer in both those questions. But I think to Deborah's point that people went from their workplace, from their practices um, in, into their home immediately and onto the screen. So here we are on screen world. So um, just a, a note from the future, which is really positive. We opened our 10 day film festival today, but many other film, international film festivals around the world and in Australia are also going online. And we're finding larger audiences than we have in cinemas, which is a, a good thing. It's different. It doesn't replace what we do in cinemas, but for instance, CPH docs in Copenhagen, which is one of the most important documentary festivals in the industry, were two days from opening and they had to close. Then they went online, spent two days crashing, found a platform that was secure, and they have about 100,000 attendances a year, and they had just over that this time. And in Australia recently, the South African Film Festival screened to more people than they normally would. And that's partly a technical glitch which has enabled that because whilst you're, um, you're getting the rights to screen films in your city, with an online world, you can only geo-block a country. It's really interesting. We're using a platform called Shift72 from New Zealand and they provide this platform to Europe, Cannes, um, I think the Toronto International Film Festival are using them. So everywhere else around the world, an international film festival geo-blocks a country, whereas um, the state system in Australia did everyone's head in. So what happened with the Sydney Film Festival is we screen over 400 films over 12 days and have about 180,000 attendances. So two months before the festival, our scenario planning said that if we went ahead with a festival, where there was no public meetings over 500 people, we would lose over a million dollars, which we've got small reserves, but it would be madness to do that. So we knew our trigger point was that 500 rule, which um, that came in place in mid-March. So we made the decision to cancel the festival and within a week, everybody was at home. So um, my company and board and the film industry were all on Zoom together. One of the things we decided as the Sydney Film Festival is we knew there were great storytellers and curatorial services online and it wasn't our specialty. We, we were about premiering films and the other thing that was really important about our festival, it's not just for the audience, it's for the filmmakers. So what was really important to us were the official competitions, which are the documentary competition, short film and the official um, competition. So we decided that we would go ahead with a, a, a limited edition, so a very tight program, and that we wouldn't be telling what pe people what to watch on Netflix or YouTube or anything. So we then decided, uh, we got the technology through Shift 72, we got the filmmakers um, approval and participation, and we launched our festivals. So today we've exceeded the attendance for our Australian documentary and European women film program that we would have had in real time in the cinema. So yes, we're getting to a larger audience. It's still primarily in Sydney, 
Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting change, but the business model is the thing that will stop us um, pursuing this because filmmakers make most of their money in theatrical release, then they sell for broadcast rights and then they go to video on demand or if they're lucky enough, they get a Netflix um, purchase. So we're, we're doing an online premiere, which is at the skinny end of the income for a film. So it's not a great advantage to the film or even the Sydney Film Festival to be doing that. Um, the other difference that we've implemented is that where we have as many filmmakers as we can afford to attend the film festival, that's possibly 180. This time round, everybody has self-filmed introductions. They've all done the most amazing Q and A's with journalists and um, editors and um, our programmers that are screened after the film. And then we'll also be showing live panels on different topics through the festival. So there's a really rich environment of engagement with the filmmakers. Um, so there, there are things that we'll probably take into our festival next year, but um, the ability to get theatrical release is what the film industry absolutely relies on. It will, you know, it won't work. So um, on that point, we had about half of our program in place. So when we shut down the industry, shut down production as well. And many of the films we were trying to get internationally or we'd secured will hold over to 2021 because they can't go straight to video on demand. It would just be death to them. So I would imagine next year's program will be a mix of what we would have had this year and what can go into production for next year. Um, the, the accessibility that this online virtual world provides is really exciting. We started with Screen New South Wales a couple of years ago, a program called Screenability, where New, Screen New South Wales were um, commissioning filmmakers who identify as having a disability to make short films and we were premiering them and we were also doing them in the most accessible versions we could, which as we are hiring commercial cinemas isn't exactly perfect. So this ability to have a program which is really accessible is fantastic. And also to communities in regional Australia, because although we do a traveling film festival to Queensland, Northern Territory and New South Wales, and we were just due to increase by five centers in New South Wales, um, many of the films we screen never get to regional centres, so we've got a vastly bigger program than our travelling film festival program in Australia. So I would hope there'll be some sort of hybrid model that um, helps the filmmakers survive and get the shared experience of seeing their films in cinemas, but also that there's an interest that grows and is um, really nurtured in regional Australia. That's such, a, that's such a good point. I love that the that we are becoming more confident in a digital world um, and that's also creating a desire for more digital content um, that's created for that context rather than simply being transported or translated to a new platform. Um, my next question is for the panel, um, but particularly for, for Deborah and Shireen. Um, what role should artists be playing at the moment? And what role do artists um, should be playing in helping society understand the world as it is? Um, and whether there's examples from your own practice, something that you're working on um, that you could share with us? Like to go first, Deborah? Um, well, I'll step in if you like. Um, just on, an aspect for my own personal practice, I'll step in there and be completely frank. I've been, creatively, I've been completely crippled by the COVID-19 crisis. And partly it's because I've, I've, I've had very little time because shifting to online teaching has involved a huge amount of work. And the rather cruisy semester I was planning to have, um, it's turned out to be some weeks I was working three times harder than I normally would, converting my, you know, teaching materials to be a good online product, not just to be online, but to be something of quality. 
But the other reason, and, and much more important than that, is this weird sense of disconnection. And it is weird because writers are um, like other creative practitioners, the people who are here to respond to a crisis. And this is a real crisis. But I have found that working on a contemporary novel, as I am at the moment, or not working on it, though I should be, to be a, a real challenge because the question for me is how do I keep writing a contemporary novel that doesn't reference the current crisis? But how can I incorporate any reference to that current crisis and not seem opportunistic, not seem to be using a trick, um, not seem to be glib? And most of all, how can I do it um, in a way that's thoughtful and reflective? Because I find I need time to reflect on something as important as, you know, a national, uh, an international pandemic. And the only thing I can think of that was a little bit similar was, of course, the September 11 crisis, which, again, was a huge shock to the entire world. And I remember talking to other writers at the time and we all were expressing a similar feeling, which is that we knew it was important and we knew we had to respond to it but we just couldn't respond to it at that time. And in speaking with other writers at the moment, I've found that what I'm feeling is, is quite similar. And um, one, one writer expressed it to me um, a month or so ago as saying that I, she said, I need a blank canvas on which my imagination will project itself. And out there, it's far from being a blank canvas at the moment. And, and of course it's, it's almost like what's happening out there is a fiction. And um, particularly with the antics of someone like Donald Trump, it seems to be more of a fictional world every day than a real world. And it's like our imaginations are, are having to compete with that and failing to compete with that. And I know this will change. We just need time to be able to process it. So it'll be interesting to see what your point of view is, Shireen, in, in terms of this, if, if in your field you're having similar um, challenges? I think, um, I think COVID and the lockdown, um, it has, it ha I don't think it's changed necessarily what I think art's role is um, or its value, but it's certainly amplified um, and exaggerated um, you know, the, the need, the need, or it's shown, I think, at least I said this to my students in the first few weeks, I said, oh, here we are, this is this, if we, if we try and look at this from a kind of positive perspective, you know, usually um, as artists, as creators, as art students, as design students, as photographers, we sit and we observe um, these events which are going on somewhere else to other people. And when we make our work, we make it quite unconsciously from that perspective. And here we are part of something that is global, that is collective, where we're being asked to um, act in a way that is for the collective good. And, you know, how, how is it that we create in that context? And I think, that if you look at the, the Sydney Biennale, the current Sydney Biennale that just got relaunched after lockdown, um, you know, it's curated by Brooke Andrew. It's the first First Nations Biennale. And when, it, when everything had to close because of lockdown, I remember thinking, oh, why? Why this Biennale? You know, and interestingly, when it's reopened, um, it's reopened at a time that it seems like it's no accident. It's against the background of Black Lives Matter and somehow, you know, against that backdrop, that Biennale is invested with even more, um, you know, I guess, need, rigour for that kind of... I think what art does, and, and this, is what I, this is what I would like to see happen, you know, in terms of the way governments support and the rhetoric around culture and the arts is that 
what art does is that it kind of, it's reparative. It helps us, like in times like this, this is when we turn to reading novels. This is when I want to go out and dance. This is when I want to be with other people. And artists make art for other people. We don't make it to put it under our beds. <laughs> we want, I think, first and foremost, to share what we do um, with others. And whether that be a kind of a sharing of an aesthetic experience, a physical experience, a natural experience, um, it is fundamentally um, at the heart of creating. You create for others. You don't create for, just for yourself. Um, and I think that art's going to have a huge, or, you know, creativity in general has a huge role to play in helping us um, deal with trauma, in helping us come together, in helping us critique. Um, yeah, and, you know, I think that th these are the kinds of conversations that you never see at a kind of governmental level when we're talking oh. about funding and money and, yeah. and, and value. It's like, you know, we're sitting here looking at carriage works, number crunching, something that, you know, um, a philanthropist could basically pull out as, as change from their pocket and, 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 you know, help the institution. So, you know, it's, as far as we're concerned, it's, we, our value is there. Um, and I think perhaps, um, you know, we need to do a better job of articulating what that value is uh, and being really explicit and not waiting for that value to be understood just as a given, but to try and make it as explicit as what, why is culture valuable? It's as, it's as valuable as AFL, it's as valuable as NRL and any other sport that, you know, we're kind of obsessed with. That's, that's where I'd love to see it at. Thanks, Shereen. I love that idea. I mean, thank you for introducing the idea of art being reparative and being a vector for you know, essential conversation because that's such an important point. I wanted to lead that into because we're, we're getting to the Q&A section, but I also wanted to talk about um, this sense that, you know, this hasn't been a crisis that's been... Um, felt equally across our industry and um, it's going to be a long time before we see the end of it. Um, you know, international interstate travel is going to be unlikely for a, a little while longer. Um, and I'm also thinking about, you know, the federal government um, lifting content quotas at the beginning of the pandemic crisis, which has, you know, has raised concern about the impact on the local industry. Um, this question is really for Emily and for, for Lee. I want to know what you think, what kind of work will we be seeing? Um, what kind of work should we be seeing in the next 12 months um, in exhibitions and in festival environments? When, what can we expect to see? I think we can expect to see the unexpected. And I think that's what it should be. And from what Shireen was saying, you know, Art creates this third space where we can have the conversations that we feel too uncomfortable to have otherwise. And I think with the limited access to art and culture, that's what I'm seeing as a First Nations woman and as a First Nations curator. You know, we need these spaces, we need these artists, we need these exhibitions to create that third space. We may have you and me with two different opinions but we can speak to a shared experience and a shared humanity and that's what art is you know it's the narrative of our humanity and it's considering the value of that i think the way uh covid will um impact programming will be in very kind of practical ways as well you know a reliance on loans from regional collections as opposed to looking internationally or even just you know nationally so an increase of exhibition and exposure of australian artists particularly contemporary australian artists i hope we see an increasing commission and investment in australian artists 
this notion that we've been so reliant upon with our major institutions of the big blockbuster that comes at the end of the year where it grabs everyone who hasn't been to a gallery previously, increases our numbers, boosts our value to the government, that will no longer be happening. We need to change the way we consider our metric for valuing impact upon audiences. So I think that will be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think as a sector, the government has become complacent due to the generosity and reliance upon philanthropy. And I can't think of any other employment sector where this is an expectation. Mm -hmm. It's capitalising on the passion and commitment of arts workers, artists and audiences for the arts. And I fear, should we not address this, we will end up with the system much like the US, where only a small portion of our population can afford to be part of the arts. I think during the lockdown, many galleries have focused their energies towards an online presence and engagement with audiences. And this has seen incredibly uh, creative results like Caldor's Do It program, which has been extraordinary. But as Australia begins to open up and we focus back on opening up our physical cultural spaces, I think there'll be an expectation to maintain this digital platform, which has brought so many wonderful opportunities and access at the same time as running these physical spaces. And with limited staff and house, and house operations, I think that's gonna be very difficult. I was, um, I was surprised to see that a recent study by Australia Council found that only 22% of audiences are comfortable going to cultural events when restrictions are lifted. Yeah. You know, this is going to completely change the way we work. And I think, again, from my own personal experiences, I think public space will become a greater opportunity for artists, curators and audiences to access those cultural events with greater security existing within council state budgets around building an infrastructure. For me personally, this is becoming a more viable and sustainable way of curating and storytelling. I think we'll see more interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary practices that don't necessarily define themselves within visual arts. And as First Nations people, artists and practitioners, this is something we've always done. And that resilience is showing in these moments of uncertainty. So I think we're going to be seeing greater bravery and risk within the works that we take. Uh, so, Lee, what do you think? Oh, look, I, so many interesting points that you brought up, Emily, and my backgrounds, um, I have a regional home down the South Coast. But I ran Sydney Dance Company, worked at Sydney Opera House, so I've, across all of the performing arts as well as cinema. And the thing that's really exciting is there is research that galleries are necessary in regional Australia. And when there was the regional arts grants um, round last year came up, there's a fantastic gallery in Bega that wanted to expand, the community wanted to expand. It came, I think, top of all of the, in the assessment from the assessment panel and it didn't get funded. There's something number 72 on the list, nothing to do with visual arts, but um, just to a general point of what is going to happen in the future, what will people come to, how will they come together? I see that um, COVID-19 in the context of, we've been ripped by droughts, fires, and when we came to back to work in February to start programming our film festival, we usually don't see marked trends of zeitgeist of themes. And um, Nishen Moodley, our programmer, will never um, give us a, a, a publicity line of what are all the films focused on. He did this year. The films that we were curating were about the breakdown of government and the betrayal of government all across the world. So these were in documentaries, feature films, shorts, comedies, you name it. It was, it was a theme that was going through films. So those films are still there and they will come out next year. And if and, you know, enough production is remounted, then I'm sure, as Deborah said, some of the themes of the new films will have to be impacted by what everybody's just lived through. But again, I suppose I, I'm more of a Pollyanna optimist on 
people getting together quickly. I think shared experiences is in everybody's DNA. And there's, there's also an element of risk taking that people will have to come back and, and to share films in cinema with filmmakers, to go to galleries, to go to theatre. Um, and one thing that I will say on the weekend, there's also a personal prioritising of what you want to do in your own lifetime. The, the marches that went out in Sydney around Town Hall, around the Black Lives Matters on, I think it was Saturday, they, that was more important than COVID and catching something. That, that was about black deaths in custody. So I, I know I really admire Australia Council research, but um, the performing arts are looking to get back in big, big venues, 2000 seat venues in September. Um, and I'm just hoping that research isn't true, that you know, everybody will go. Um, and certainly, you know, I, I'm really excited about what our Australian filmmakers will produce for next year because, yes, they're, they're not getting any surprising help or, or from state or federal government, um, but they're inventive and they're agile and we will have their stories to share and we will share them in person because it makes a difference. You don't, you're not moved. The conversation is different if you're not there in a cinema. And I'll just finish that with a fact that 10 years ago when I started at the film festival, everybody had started the conversation of um, cinema's dead. Everybody's going to watch it on online. You don't need to go to a cinema. It's all going to die. And the same story, it comes up in a different language every year. During that time, we've almost doubled our audience and our cinemas from 300 to 2000 there is an average of 70% attendance across all of the films, all of the screenings. So individuals don't agree with staying at home and watching things by themselves. They want to watch things together. They want to experience culture and stories and debate and confrontation together. So as I say, I might be a bit overly optimistic, but it just makes sense to me. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, I've got a few questions from our audience that I'm going to throw up to the panel now. Um, and I'm just going to synthesize some of these because there's a couple of themes that are linked. So the first is um, around um, the digital space um, and how companies can ask people to pay for that content. So, um, you know, a lot of arts companies, galleries, etc., have shifted content online for free. And I think as people expect um, to see more content online, um, how do companies find a way to charge for that content? Should they charge for that content? And how do we make sure that the artists get paid? Um, because of course, a lot of those um, you know, there's instances of um, ensembles, companies asking their artists to make work online for free. Um, what are your thoughts? Panel. I'll just say very quickly, as of today, we put our film festival up online and you pay. Yeah. So, and, and I think it's, it's a very simple question from my perspective. Yeah. Charge. charge. People want the experience. Sure. So people will pay for things if they say that there's a charge for them. What does everyone else think? Uh, I think in the visual arts, it's difficult because you don't, um, yeah, you generally, I mean, you know, going to the art gallery or the MCA or carriage works or to regional galleries who have a really strong uh, role to play, or even if you look at UTS art, um, you know, we generally, unless it is a blockbuster, like Emily noted, you don't pay. Um, it's also a really diverse sort of viewing experience, the way in which you encounter contemporary art. Um, so that would, I think, be much more difficult. I think you can provide content like public programs, education, workshops, um, those sorts of things we can see are already being done, interactive projects where you can, you know, kind of um, engage with school kids in making things and thinking conceptually about things and um, I think that's amazing and those things definitely I think have a role to play in the future 
Um, but there is nothing that replaces, I think, in terms of, you know, art making, um, that tactile, you know, I mean, it's, it's like if you're an architect, you design something in, on paper or on a screen and then it gets made and people live in it and work in it and encounter it as a space. And it's very similar, I think, with contemporary art. It requires a kind of tactile, material, bodily um, response. So, yeah, I don't think it's either or. I think it's definitely um, both. There's a, there's, yeah, there's got to be a way for both those things to kind of exist going forward. Emily? I think this will, you know, I, I, with this question, I considered, you know, uh, a lot of our First Nations collections in major institutions and the incredible work that has been done by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art departments to digitise that material and make it more accessible. You know, we're getting, this really could be the opportunity where we begin to understand that the object always belongs with the maker with the maker's family, with the maker's language group, nation. Um, and the opportunity to digitise, make these collections known, will increase that access of remote communities and families to the works of their ancestors. So there's great possibility here. And it's something that I have seen over my, you know, 10 years of working in institutions develop. And I think um, there's great opportunity for artists in that way. And that does, of course, involve paying those artists, paying those families to ensure that they have that content. Yeah, absolutely. We have a question from the audience about um, dealing with, uh, here we go. Um, how do we deal with a competing sense of urgency? For example, the Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement, focusing our attention, um, how can we, um, there seems to be no communal media capacity to focus on one urgent issue at a time. So I suppose, um, what role does the arts play in focusing an audience's attention on urgent issues? Um, can I jump in there again? We've found that uh, in an era of the last four years with decline of, com of um, commercial media, decline of government owned media because of funding, um, that when people are looking for issues and trust in source of truth, that the film festival had, has had an increasing role in that. So we find that people will look to um, books, art, films to find a source of truth that formerly possibly was more delivered by commercial media. Right. As opposed to news media? Yes. Right, that's interesting. No, I think the other thing is, um, I mean, in terms of the, that question of urgency, um, education, and, and, I, and I'm putting my academic hat on here, education has such a huge role to play. And I think at least, um, you know, in our faculty and in our school, there's been, and, th and this happened, um, before COVID and when we returned for um, after the fires, that there was this incredible sense of urgency for dealing with, you know, you say the issue of climate change and that that is not going away. It's not gonna come in and then, and then we find a cure. So it's like, how do we um, educate uh, the next generation of designers and architects and creatives to, um, address first and foremost these really important issues and you know if I think about just the banter between uh, my colleagues on Slack this morning where they're circulating articles about you know anti-racist uh, readings and and so you know all of that stuff is starting at least from our perspective from an academic perspective and the university sector and the arts sector have a lot in common and you know and that is kind of how do you um, start to educate, write courses, write subjects, write content, deliver content in a way that addresses these important issues? And I think, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, the climate change and the bushfires that we saw, like, you know, it's just, you can't ignore them. You can't be teaching 
a subject like photography and not have those issues at the forefront of what you teach your students? It's really interesting in a way, you know, COVID versus Black Lives Matter. Mm. For me, COVID exposed mm. yeah. how much yeah. Black Lives Matter. Absolutely. And I saw that in the micro and the macro. Mm. The fact that I couldn't do my work because of the health issues that so many of our elders in our community held. Yeah. That we couldn't gather together to share our cultural practices because of the underlying health issues that exist within Australia. So for me, these issues do not cancel out one another. They speak to each other. And I think that's really important. And that's where art sits. It allows them to speak to each other. It creates the narrative where media perhaps may favour one over the other. Art focuses on that grey area. And I think that's really, 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 really important. In my own practice, the way I think about it is... I facilitate the conversations that are too uncomfortable to have otherwise, you know, whether that's exhibitions or whether that's experiences. Um, a number of years, years ago, I was uh, fortunate enough to produce and curate a project called 4,000 Fish that spoke to the devastation of Sydney Harbour from colonisation a very difficult conversation to have to a lot of people and I was used to having that conversation shut down mm. but what it comes down to is if you can create an art project a film a, a, a written work an experience that people can come together and to, can share it can facilitate that conversation that we're not having in the media we can't rely on the media for that that's why art is so important at the moment and always. I think that's such an amazing note to end on. Thank you for our, thank you to our panel. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to Julie for organising. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you guys. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we hope that you can attend our future Life After Lockdown events. Uh, there's one tomorrow about the role of carers um, during this crisis. Um, if you have some spare time and would like to try a UTS taster course, visit open.uts.edu.au for um, some options for free online courses. This webinar is going to be up on YouTube pretty soon and uh, I look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you so much.